Now, to understand the inflammatory response, we need to think about blood vessels, and in particular, the small blood vessels. Now, when a tissue is first insulted, there'll be a very short-lived, transient vasoconstriction. The blood vessels will go down, and there'll be a white colour to the insulted area. But very quickly, that's going to change into a vasodilatory response. So let's start off this story by thinking about a normal capillary. And as you know, a normal capillary is composed of squamous endothelial cells with a basement membrane. So here we have a normal capillary with squamous endothelial cells, each cell with its own nucleus. Blood, of course, goes into the capillary from an arteriole, goes through the capillary, and leaves via a venule. So we have a normal capillary. And capillaries are very narrow vessels, very often only one red cell can fit through at a time in the smaller capillaries. So the blood's coming in from an arteriole, and here we see the red cells Remember the red cells are biconcave discs, so the darker on the outside, lighter on the inside. Here we have the red cells going through a normal non-inflamed capillary. From time to time, I suppose, there'll be a white cell as well. There's a neutrophil just, uh, just going through. So a normal capillary cells going through just one at a time. Now, when there's an inflammatory response, there's going to be the release of inflammatory mediators, chemicals which are locally released that bring about or facilitate the inflammatory response. And the main thing that happens in the inflammatory response is there's going to be a vasodilation. The arterioles are going to dilate, the capillaries are going to dilate, letting much more blood into the capillaries. So there's going to be a vasodilation. So let's now draw a dilated capillary as a result of the effect of inflammatory mediators. So there's going to be some insult to that tissue. The insult is going to cause an inflammatory response. And the Cells now have larger gaps between them. And the whole capillary is widened and dilated. Now, if you think about it, if that's a normal capillary, there's only small gaps between the cells, the endothelial cells, comprising the wall of a small capillary. There are gaps, but only small gaps. But when the capillary is dilated, can you see that means that the cells don't stretch? In fact, the cells can even get smaller, but the cells certainly don't get any bigger. So you're going to get bigger gaps between the individual cells. So there we have a dilated capillary with bigger gaps between the individual cells. Now the first thing we notice is that when the arterioles and the capillaries dilate in this inflammatory response, you can now get a lot more blood through that area. So now we've got space for lots of red cells to go through all at the same time. So we've now got a lot more red cells going through the area. We call this a localised hyperemia. Hyper, high emia blood. There's a localised hyperemia. And we can notice that this causes a redness in the tissue as well because there's more red cells going through it. So if we just make a note here, that causes the redness. 
we can tick that off because we've accounted for the redness as a result of the localized hyperemia. So why do you get redness in, infl in an inflammatory response? Because there's a localized hyperemia causing the redness. But why do we want a localized hyperemia? Why is it so important that there's more red cells going through the tissue? Well, the red cells, of course, carry oxygen to the tissues and the blood supply takes away waste carbon dioxide. And the capillary is going through a tissue and in the tissue, of course, there's going to be tissue cells. In this case, green tissue cells with their cell membrane, the dark staining nucleus in the middle and the cytoplasm around the outside. That's what a tissue is. A tissue is a group of similar cells with associated extracellular material and its blood supply. So here we have the tissue cells. But of course this tissue has recently been traumatized. So if some of these cells are going to be dead. Some of these cells are going to be killed by whatever insult it was that generated the inflammatory response. We're going to have some dead cells. And also we're going to have some injured cells. Some cells might not be dead, but they might be injured. Either way, whether the cells are dead or simply injured, they need to be re replaced if they're dead or repaired if they're just injured. In other words, there needs to be building up of new cells. There needs to be anabolic processes building up new tissue. And anabolic processes building up new tissue requires a lot of energy. So you need a lot of energy to do that. And whenever you're producing energy, you need a lot of oxygen. So the hyperemia is going to bring large volumes of oxygen to the inflamed tissue that's going to diffuse out through the tissue fluids and the oxygen is going to go where it is needed in the repairing tissues because remember tissue repair is hard work it uses a lot of energy therefore it needs a lot of oxygen and conveniently that's exactly what the inflammatory response is supplying in all these red cells Wound oxygenation is absolutely critical. You need good perfusion of a wound and you need good oxygenation of a wound or it's not going to heal properly. So whenever you're treating wounds, think, is this wound getting a good blood supply? Because if it's not, you're going to have great difficulty healing it. Whenever you're treating a wound, think, is this wound getting a good oxygen supply? Because if it's not, you're not getting the energy production in the cells and that wound won't heal. But in the natural inflammatory response, we see the redness because of the hyperemia supplies the oxygen. And because there's more blood going through the area, more red cells and plasma, that means the carbon dioxide, which is produced as a result of the anabolic repair processes, can be taken away from the site of the wound because if the carbon dioxide is left at the site of the wound that's going to contribute to the formation of carbonic acid in the tissues and the tissue is going to become acidic and it's generally not good and in fact if there's not enough oxygen supply that can result in anaerobic metabolism which can also produce lactic acid contributing to acidosis so it's very important there's a good blood supply getting rid of the carbon dioxide taking the oxygen, keeping the pH of the tissues at the optimum level for healing. So that's good. That accounts for the redness. <clears throat> now, we also see that the gaps between the individual capillary cells, as we've already noted, is increased. And this is clearly going to increase the permeability of the capillary. This means more tissue fluid is going to be formed as it exudes out from the plasma. So tissue fluid is going to be formed in greater amounts than normal because the capillary has increased 
permeability. Because of the vasodilation, there's bigger gaps between the individual capillary cells and more tissue fluid is going to get out. If there's more tissue fluid getting out, that's going to account for the swelling. So we've accounted for the, um, the redness, this accounts for the swelling. The swelling is caused by the increased amount of tissue fluid forming. Now, why do we want an increased amount of tissue fluid to be formed? Well, if more tissue fluid is being formed, remember that the nutrients are supplied to the tissue cells via the plasma and via the tissue fluid. So if more tissue fluid is being formed, that means more essential nutrients, which nutrients which are essential for the healing process are being delivered to the injured tissue. So for new cells to be formed, your, the cells need to make new proteins. To make new proteins, they need the essential amino acids. The only way those amino acids are going to get to the new cells to help form the new tissue is from the plasma via the tissue fluid. To form new cell membranes, what are cell membranes made up of mostly? Do you remember? Cell membranes, membranes round about the outside of the cell. And of course there's numerous membranes inside the cell as well. Endoplasmic reticulum, for example, <coughs> is an extensive membrane-bound system inside the cell. So to make new cells we need to make a lot of new cell membranes. And cell membranes are made mostly of phospholipids. They are fat-based structures. So to make new cell membranes, we're going to need lots of fatty acids to build up into the new lipids, which are going to comprise the cell membrane. Also, if we're going to form new structural proteins, such as collagen, we need amino acids, obviously, because it's a protein. But also, we need vitamin C for the formation of collagen. This is why wounds won't heal if there's not enough amino acids, if there's not enough protein, if there's not enough of the right fatty acids, and if there's not enough vitamins, because we need vitamins as well. <coughs> so, to build up the new structural proteins, the new collagen, vitamin C is essential. The only way the vitamin C is going to get to the tissues that need it is via the plasma, via the tissue fluids. There's no other way it can get it. More tissue fluids means a greater supply of the essential building blocks for healing, regeneration of the tissues. Also, because of the vasodilation, increased formation of tissue fluid, we're going to get increased volumes of glucose coming out to the cells. And glucose is essential because we need to combine the glucose with the oxygen to produce the energy. So that's absolutely essential as well. So we need all these nutrients going to the tissues. Without nutrients, without the right nutrients, your patient's wounds are not going to heal. So poorly people, wounded people, people with wounds, if they're going to recover, if those wounds are going to heal, as well as needing the blood supply, as well as needing the oxygen supply, we have to feed them properly. We have to give them the essential nutrients they need for wound healing. And then the inflammatory process should take care of delivering them to the cells where they're actually required. Now, <clears throat> if there's been a cut and an injury here, it's quite possible that we're going to get bacteria in the wound there's a risk of infection, especially with cuts, abrasions, burns, of course, are very likely to become infected. So all sorts of bacteria can get into the wound, contaminating the wound. This is going to be a risk. And the bacteria also release toxins. 
that poison the tissues. So the bacteria themselves are a problem and the toxins they produce are going to be a problem. And in fact the bacterial toxins can often kill tissue cells and prevent regeneration of tissue cells. And in fact this is another universal principle. If wounds are infected they're not going to heal. So if you can't keep your patient's wounds clean with good wound management, if you can't recognise infection at an early stage and give your patients antibiotics to kill off these bacteria effectively, then again, wound healing becomes less likely. Infected wounds don't heal. They can become chronic and be present for years. Infected wounds don't heal. But we've noted that there's bacteria and we've also noted that there's an increased amount of tissue fluids and the increased amount of tissue fluids will help to dilute any bacterial toxins which are there. If there's more fluids there'll be a dilution effect diluting the toxic effects of the bacterial toxins. So there's going to be a dilution effect as well which is also going to be good. And as well as that when there's vasodilation, there's plasma proteins can leak out from the plasma as well. So we can get the release of plasma proteins. And there's one particular plasma protein can leak out called fibrinogen. And fibrinogen in the tissues is going to be converted to a long sticky protein called fibrin. So we'll end up with strands of fibrin in the tissue spaces. So the fibrinogen leaks out when it's soluble, but that's converted to long sticky strands of fibrin in the tissues. And what these long sticky strands of fibrin can do <coughs> is they can compartmentalize areas of infection to stop it from spreading. So the fibrinogen has leaked out of the capillaries. That's been converted to fibrin over a relatively short period of time in the tissue spaces. And the fibrin the fibrin has compartmentalized this area of infection and stopped it from spreading. But the only reason the fibrinogen could get out was because of the vasodilatory response. Now, we've mentioned that the inflammatory response is caused by the release of inflammatory mediators. So we get the release of inflammatory mediators in the tissue. And in the tissue as well, there are specialised receptors, pain receptors, called nociceptors. The nociceptors detect pain. And what the inflammatory mediators do is they increase the sensitivity of the nociceptors. And when you increase the sensitivity of the nociceptors, it makes it easier for them to generate a new nerve impulse. Technically what's happening is that the inflammatory mediators have lowered the depolar depolarization threshold of the nociceptors. And what this does is it causes an area of hyperalgesia, an increased sensitivity to pain. So that accounts for the pain. So we've accounted for the redness, the swelling and the pain. But we haven't accounted for the heat yet. So how do we account for the heat? Well, normally the surface of the body is at much lower temperatures than the core of the body. But in inflammation we're going to get this vasodilatory response and this means lots of warm blood from the core of the body is going to be diverted to the surface of the body. 
This means that the inflamed area, because it's got lots of warm blood from the core of the body, the inflamed area with all this warm blood is going to feel warmer than the surrounding areas. It's as simple as that. So it's the hyperemia that le leads to the feelings of warmth. So we've accounted for the heat, pain, redness and swelling and we've noted that all these things are important for the healing response. And the pain is also important because the pain alerts us to the fact that something's wrong and it's going to promote rest. We're going to rest that tissue and as a general principle rest is going to promote healing as well. So a lot of the loss of function in a part of the body often comes from the pain, the pain response. So what we've looked at here really is, is the vascular response. There's a vascular response that's going to increase the blood supply and have all these beneficial effects. But the second response after the vascular response is the cellular response. There's going to be a leukocytic response, a response of the white blood cells, a response of the leukocytes. And the first thing that happens when there's an inflammatory response is that we get granulocytes migrating from the blood into the tissue spaces. So let's just give ourselves another, another cell here, make this capillary a bit bigger, a bit longer. Now what happens is in inflammation, first of all, white cells in the area are going to start migrating towards the edge of the capillary and they're going to sort of slowly roll along the edge of the capillary and then eventually when they come to a suitable gap they're going to squeeze out of the gap. So here we have a white cell, in this case a neutrophil, squeezing out of the gap from the blood through the enlarged gap in the capillary cells into the tissue spaces. And within 90 minutes of the initial insult, you're actually getting quite large numbers of neutrophils in the tissue spaces. Usually three lobes, sometimes four lobes. So we're getting a great increase in the number of neutrophils in the inflamed tissue. Now, why do you think it's important that we get these neutrophils in the inflamed tissue. Well as you know neutrophils are phagocytic. They are able to phagocytose bacteria for example. So if there's bacteria in the wound the neutrophils are able to phagocytose the bacteria ingesting and digesting the bacteria keeping the wound hopefully sterile probably won't be quite sterile but certainly hope, hopefully preventing infection. So the phagocytic effect of the neutrophils is going to be phagocytosing nasty bacteria. But also remember that because this tissue has been killed or insulted rather because the tissue is insulted some of the body cells are actually going to be killed as a result of the trauma. So some of the tissue cells are going to be killed. This means we've got a problem. This means we've got dead tissue in the wound. Dead tissue in the wound. And dead tissue is a problem for several reasons. One is that living cells can't migrate over dead cells to bring about the healing and regeneration of the tissues. But also the dead cells are an ideal ecological niche for bacteria. They're very likely to lead to infection. So what we need to do is get rid of the dead cells. The dead cells need to be phagocytosed as well in a physiological process of debridement. So the cells are physically <coughs> ingesting 
dead tissue cells, the neutrophils, phagocytos, dead tissue cells. That prevents infection and it's, it's, it's sometimes called the destructive process in wound healing this. You're destroying the dead cells to make a nice clean space for the new cells to migrate into. So that's very important. And then within 24 hours, another type of cell present in the blood called the monocytes, very often they have a sort of a horseshoe shaped nucleus, something like that. Within 24 hours, monocytes will also start migrating out of tissue spaces into the wound. So here's a monocyte, again, migrating through the widened gap in the capillary cell. So that's going to increase the number of monocytes in the tissue spaces. Now, what do we call monocytes when they're in the tissue spaces? Well, when the monocytes migrate from the blood into the tissue spaces, they change their name and they become macrophages. Macro means big. Macrophages are big eaters. And these can seriously phagocytose dead tissue cells, seriously phagocytose bacteria and hopefully get the wound nice and clean in this destructive phase, ready for the healing that's about to take place. And after 24 hours, we're going to get significant amounts of macrophages in the wound. And within 48 hours, the macrophages are the predominant leukocytic cell type in the wound. So there we have the inflammatory response. We've accounted for the heat, pain, redness and swelling. This inflammatory response is going to be the same regardless of what caused the inflammatory response. We've noted that we can recognize the inflammatory response by heat, pain, redness, swelling and loss of function. And we've noted that the inflammatory response is an absolutely essential first stage in the healing process. Firstly, by this vasogenic response and the beneficial effects that we've seen in that. And secondly, with the cellular response, with the release of the granulocytic neutrophils. And secondly, the monocytes that become macrophages that get rid of the bacteria, get rid of the dead tissue, and actually the macrophages particularly coordinate a lot of the healing processes by releasing chemical signals called cytokines that stimulate and coordinate the healing response.